Okay, so today we're going to follow up a little more about uh, this item about Mel and about real programming. What I should have said uh, at the very start is that uh, these techniques of real programming, and real programming as in quotes here, is really very bad. Uh, it will get you fired from most companies these days because most people uh, could probably write these programs but they're very, very difficult to understand and read back. And that includes yourself about two weeks after you've written the program. It's almost impossible to work out what you've done without uh, scratching your head. And as uh, most commercial programs are read many more times than they're written, it's important they're understandable and not um, taking liberties with them by doing these strange tricks. So today I want to talk about uh, one of the second tools in the armor of uh, the real programmer, in this case Mel. And again, not something you should ever do because uh, I'll explain why, but there, there's various disasters that are waiting for you. So this one is about self-modifying code. So what is self-modifying code? It's a program that can change itself. So it, uh, a program will just go through executing instructions in memory, but there is uh, perhaps no restriction necessarily on the fact that you may go and change those instructions. So whilst you run through your instructions the first time, the program may go and change those instructions. So eventually the program looks nothing like what it started out as. So why might you do this? There are a couple of possible reasons why you might do this. Uh, and they're almost always in very strange and weird conditions. So uh, typically you should never do this. So the first case is when uh, you're in very constrained environments and this may be such as booting up a computer. Typically on a computer boot, you are allowed to read a few instructions from either the disk or a CD or a, a memory stick or something like that. You, you'll get just a few bytes read in by the operating uh, environment and you have to do something with those few bytes to load in the next section so this is what's known as bootstrapping often this will include overwriting the instructions you're currently running to write a program that will load in the rest of the operating system so that's a possible case not very common that you will need to do this sort of thing uh, there are other occasions where you might need to do it in very constrained environments and uh, if we go back to Mel's story, he, he uh, was a, a wizard doing this sort of thing. The other main place that this is used these days also is a nefarious one, which is computer viruses. Computer viruses often disguise themselves by uh, creeping into your computer in some encrypted form and then decrypting their code and then jumping into this decrypted code. So even you, if you get a copy of the virus, you can't work out what it's doing until you manage to decrypt it. So this is just another way of uh, hiding things. There are also things like Trojan horses that also rely on uh, corrupting memory and then uh, jumping into the middle of it and starting instruction from there. So uh, those are the two cases that I can think of where you might use it, and one of them is um, particularly nasty. Uh, reasons why you shouldn't do it. The first is it's almost impossible to debug. It's uh, because you... You start off with a, a program on this side and your running system here and very quickly the running system bears no relation to the program because it keeps getting modified. So if you're trying to work out what's going on, this uh, starting code isn't really going to help you because that no longer reflects what's actually running on the machine. Uh, the second is that um, you may not be able to do it at all. In fact, modern operating systems usually mark the code that is uh, full of instructions as read only. So you can only read the instructions and execute them. You can't actually go and change them. And this is particularly because viruses have done this thing of actually changing code. So if you restrict your uh, uh, code sections of your program to being read only, then you can't have a virus go and uh, change the program under your feet. So you may well not be able to do this at all particularly in modern operating systems. They protect you from doing that. And the third problem is that modern computers, again, 
for efficiency reasons, they, they want to do things in the uh, normal way that you would execute a program. So part of the execution environment is to pull instructions from memory into a cache so they're local and ready to run. And then they start getting loaded into the CPU. And whilst the computer is executing one instructions, it's already starting to decode the next instruction. And this is a whole pipeline that is getting ready. So everything is in a sort of a, a sequence so that it's ready to uh, execute as fast as possible. If you go and change one of those instructions, then you wipe out all this uh, this work that it's done. If you go and change an instruction, it has to go and reload the cache because it's now changed. Uh, if it's halfway through decoding an instruction ready to execute it, it might have to stop that. So th this can stall all sorts of uh, issues. So that's another reason why we're not uh, encouraged to do it. So with that, let's go on and have a look at some. So let's just, uh, to begin with, have a look at a basic program. So this is about the simplest Hello World program I could write using no standard libraries or anything, just raw operating system calls. And if we compile that and run it, uh, you can see there, it produces Hello World. But what I was interested in is uh, if we actually um, dump out the binary of this. So here we have uh, dumped out what it actually contains, and you can see here it's disassembled it. And this is the actual program. Uh, we won't worry too much about it. But this is uh, the assembler over here. And this is the actual raw binary, the instructions. So 55 would be a push register BP onto the stack. But you can see here really what I'm trying to illustrate is that uh, these are just numbers here. So there's a 55 here, a 48, an 89, and these are all hexadecimal. But it's quite possible for you to have a program that could, uh, instead of moving this register from here to here, it could move a number from here to here. So we could change the 55 for a 48 or whatever else. So this is how you'd go about writing a self-modifying program that some of these instructions would go and change the instructions that you'd actually already written. So that is why it gets quite complicated because uh, this, this program continually changes. Now we could actually go and write one of those, but uh, I'm not particularly good at assembly language anyway. So I thought instead we'd take a different world example. Programs have been described in various ways, but uh, one way is to equate it to a recipe. So here I've got uh, a recipe for a Victoria sponge, I think it is. This is how you might lay out uh, the equivalent of a program. So recipes have quite well defined ways of laying out now, and most people understand that and they know how to interpret recipes. So typically you have a set of ingredients. Here we've got uh, sugar, butter, eggs, self-raising flour, baking powder and milk, and then a set of instructions with what to do with those. So you can think of this as almost the data, and this is the instructions. So you follow the instructions through and you end up with a cake. Now, if instead we want to look at something a bit more akin to the self-modifying program, this would be something a bit more like this. So it starts off looking a bit like a regular program. So we start with two tablespoons of milk, 140 grams of flour, one egg and one teaspoon of baking powder and we set the oven to 170 degrees and grease has caked in. But then it gets a bit more complicated because then it says if it's after 3 p.m., let's add three more eggs and 100 grams of butter and 100 grams of sugar to the ingredients. Otherwise, let's delete the baking powder from the list of the ingredients and add 180 milliliters of milk to the ingredients and actually also turn up the oven by the amount of flour divided by three. And then next, if there is just one egg, swap the cake tin for a muffin tin. Otherwise, add 60 grams of flour to the ingredients. And then we have some more instructions. Mix the last two ingredients, add any remaining eggs, add any remaining flour, and so on. And cook for 10 minutes plus two times the number of eggs used. Now, perhaps you can get a sense of this, that although it starts off as a sort of regular recipe, you've actually got no idea really how much of any ingredients, or indeed what ingredients, you've got to use, because it modifies them as you go along. You've got an extra totally different thing. We've got butter here that isn't actually mentioned here. Uh, we've got sugar that's not mentioned. And although it says one egg here, we find later on that we need th another three more eggs. So 
It's very difficult to work out what this program is doing, and it's quite difficult to write this program in the first place and to get it to, to come out uh, into something sensible. But I think if I got it right, this will either make uh, a Victoria sandwich or a Yorkshire pudding. So you can see it's quite compact in that we have one recipe that can produce two different things. But actually, it's a nightmare to actually understand, to work out what's going on here, what ingredients you need, what temperature the oven would be, and what it's going to produce. You don't know until you're actually running through the program. This would not be a great recipe to interpret. It's much easier to go back to the original type of recipe, which we all know and love, and this is also true for programs. If you follow the uh, sort of, I hate to say it, the recipe for doing a program that you, um, you set out your data, then you run through the instructions and you don't modify the instructions. It's okay to have conditional parts in the instructions, but you don't go and modify them. Then uh, we all know where we are really. So uh, yeah, just like this is the right way to write a recipe, Unless you can think of very strange conditions, you would not write a recipe like this, even though it might be more compact and you could get several recipes all in one uh, tiny 4x10 card or something like that. And then it would have to spin all the way around here before it could pick up the next instruction, which was print B. And this, he could work out, was enough time for the... That is a huge print. problem. If you go to a website you're, you're, you, know, you don't see the IP address right, on your browser, for example. You just type 